Hey guys, so I want to do something a little bit different today, but I do a lot of end body simulations for my work and I thought it would be cool to show you how you can do some too and it's probably not as hard as you might think. So the software I use is called Rebound and it is a free open source package and you will need Python to do this. Well, there's a C version as well, but that's like more complicated and I don't know, I don't use C, so Python. But even if you don't know Python, I think it's pretty simple. You should probably be able to follow along, hopefully. So I'm going to be doing this on my work laptop, which is a Linux computer running um, Ubuntu. But this should work just as well on Mac, I think. I don't actually know though, because the last time I used a Mac was one of these babies in my like middle school computer labs. <laughs> Not a Mac person at all. If you are on Windows, um, Rebound wasn't written to work with Windows, but you can use the Windows Linux subsystem to basically run a Linux shell on Windows. But again, I also haven't done that, so I can't really offer any experience on that. And you will also need to already have uh, Python installed, which should come standard, I think, on most, uh, most computers. I think. <laughs> okay, so to go ahead and install Rebound, it's super simple to do. You can just pip install it. Now I already have it installed, so I'm not actually going to do it, but I'll show you that's how you would do it. Pip install Rebound. And for me, that's as much as I'm going to be using the terminal. <laughs> if you want to use the terminal, go right ahead. But what you're going to need is your favorite Python coding um, setup. For me, I just use the default. This is how I learned how to write code years ago and it works well enough and I've just never really felt the need to do anything different. So I don't know, I guess I'm just basic, but this is how I do it. So to get started, we are going to need to import that rebound module that you just installed. And let me save this file. Um, I'm going to go ahead and import NumPy and Matplotlib because those are always useful. I feel like I'm doing like a live coding exercise. <laughs> this is a little bit stressful. Okay, you can go ahead and run that and make sure you don't have any problems importing those packages. Okay, so we're really just going to do an intro today, not anything too complicated. So the first thing you need to do is actually create the simulation object. And if the word object scares you, don't worry, you really don't need to worry about it. But what you do need to do is give your simulation a name. I like to use sim because straightforward is always best in coding in my experience. Now at any point you can call sim.status and get the status of your simulation. Right now, there's nothing in the simulation. There's no particles, zero particles, but it will tell you what rebound version you're using and what the time of the um, simulation is, defaults to start at zero, and what the current time step is, and the selected integrator. But these are all defaults and you don't need to worry about it. We won't be changing any of those. So I should mention that the default units in rebound are actually uh, the astronomical unit, the solar mass, and the year per two pi. And the reason for this is because um, this is basically the units that make g, the gravitational constant, equal to 1. So these are very useful units, but I do not happen to find them very intuitive because I can never remember if you're supposed to multiply or divide by 2 pi when you're converting into like actual years and it's just confusing to me. So what I always do is assign units, which you can do just by passing any set of three units that is mass, length, and time. And there's like various ones that it will recognize, but you can always go ahead and try. So let's go ahead and use uh, earth mass. Uh, a day and we'll stick with AU. And then you can always print what the units are. Whoops. See, look at that. Okay, there you go. Now we've checked that the units are actually right. So now let's go ahead and add some bodies to this end body simulation. So the first body that you add is going to be considered to be the primary by default, so you don't really need to give it any um, like orbital attributes or position, it will just put it at the center of the origin of the coordinate system, but you do need to give it a mass. So we set this was in Earth masses, so for I'm adding a star right now, so it's gonna be a lot. Let's make this kind of like a Proxima Sen type system, which I think is around 40,000 Earth masses. And remember, you can always check the status here. You will see um, that there is one rebound particle object in your simulation and it has zeros for positions and velocities. So it's just sitting there. When you add additional particles, you're going to have to give them some sort of position relative to that first particle. Now there's a few ways that you can do this. You can give it X, Y, and Z positions and X, Y, and Z velocities, but that's very, uh, pretty uncommon to do because that's not the most intuitive way to think about this, but you can also just give them orbital elements. Now those orbital elements by default will be in reference to the particles that are already in the simulation. If you want to make them relative to a different particle, like for example, if you were adding a moon that was orbiting a planet, then you would just need to specify that the planet was the thing that you were giving the 
orbital parameters in reference to. But we're not going to do that today. We're just going to add some planets orbiting the star. Since I was inspired by Proxima Sen, let's do Proxima Sen D, which is a new planet that they just found recently, and it has a mass of about 0.25 Earth masses, and it has a period of about five days. And it has an eccentricity of around 0.04, I think. Now you can add more parameters here. The only one you absolutely have to specify is the period or the semi-major axis. And then there are default attributes. So you don't need to specify, it will just default to them. Now, if you were actually, you know, gonna do this in a little bit more detail, you would want to be familiar with what those defaults are so you would know like what was happening, <laughs> but we're not gonna worry about that today. So there we go. Now we added the second particle. Let's go ahead and check the status of our sim again. There we go. Now we see that there's two particles in here and you'll see now that this particle has an X position. Okay, and then there's another planet um, that's around, I think 1.6 Earth masses and it has a period of around 11 days. It's in the habitable zone. Now, because we're only putting in a couple values here, I want to be clear, I'm not actually completely faithfully recreating Proxima Centauri system. It was just my inspiration. I had to pick something. Okay, so now the magic. And by magic, I mean math. <laughs> That's the actual integration of this. So we can see how these particles are going to move over time under the influence of gravity. To do this, you're just going to call the integrate function on the sim, and you're going to add the end of the time that you want to simulate to. So since it defaults to start at a time in the simulation of zero, if we add 100 here, this just means integrate the simulation to 100 days, because we have days set as our unit. We can check the status afterwards, and we'll see that things have changed. So now we see the simulation time has changed to 100 days, the time step changed because we're using an adaptive time step integrator, and the positions of the particles have changed. There you go, you did it. You just integrated an n-body problem. But that might not be the most useful unless you are really just interested in a particular point in time. You probably want to see something like how this is changing over time. So basically the best way to do this is instead of just integrating all 100 days at once to break it up into chunks and to see what it's doing at each point in time. Now I'm going to use a little bit of background coding knowledge here, but hopefully this is nothing that you can't follow. So basically we want to set up some arrays to save the data. So um, let's say we want to save the X positions and the Y positions over time. So we can make X pause an array, X position here. And let's break this 100 days up into just 10 days. Three X positions, because we have three particles, and we have 10 time steps. Let's do the same thing for the Y positions. And we'll go ahead and set up an array of the times, and this is just going to be evenly spaced between 0 and 100 in 10 steps. So now we have arrays waiting, ready to receive some data. So now we need to make the data. We're going to enumerate our times array, um, which basically we'll just call a number of the step and the value of the step. So this will integrate 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, etc. And then we can save the X and Y positions. Now, you might be like thinking, what about Z? Yes, I would agree. There is definitely a Z position, but in this case, we didn't give any inclination. We just made a flat system. And so Z is going to be zero. So I'm not going to bother saving it in this case. Okay, so to actually get this value to save, you want to access the particle. To do that, you're going to do sim.particles. So sim.particles is basically a you can think of it as a list of the particles, and then you want to identify which particle, which you do by calling an index, which is just a number in brackets. Now in computer science and coding, you start counting from zero. So zero is the first particle you added, and two is the last. So zero, one, two are the numbers of the particles here. To get the attribute that you're interested in, you're just going to do dot something, and you can see this whole list that pop popped up here, and these are all the things that you can um, access from the particle. So we wanted to get x, and now we'll do y as well. We want to specify which oops, which array or which position in the array we're saving in. So we're going to do it for the first particle. And then I is remember this, just the number of the step we're on. So it will save it to the right step. Okay, now there are way more efficient ways to do this, but <laughs> I'm not trying to give you an intro to coding here. So just hopefully this will make sense. Okay, so now I'm just specifying to save for each of the particles. So call different particles, the X and Y interested, you could just print. Whoops. Oh my gosh. See, look, this is, this is what happens. All right. This is coding. This is life. <laughs> I, I use the wrong command and I use this literally every day. You'd think I'd know. Okay. So here we can see that the X positions were saved over time or printed them out. But again, most people don't really like to read this kind of data. We want to see it. So I'm just going to use a quick, um, matplotlib function here to look at these x and y positions that we gathered. So I'm going to make the x positions the x and the y positions the y's and I want to show the figure. 
Okay, so what what if, what even is this? Okay, well, one, this is a terrible plot because I didn't label any axes or make any colors or anything. <laughs> but basically what's going on here is we're seeing the planets and the star kind of trace out their orbits. So the star is basically staying right at the center, as you would expect. Um, this is the interior planet, and then this is the exterior planet. But you're thinking, okay, why am I only seeing a little portion of it? Well, it's just, just because this has a period of 11 days, and we called this every 10 days. And so just by chance, we're only seeing it move a little bit farther forward because we're only taking a couple snapshots in time. Okay, so we saw that we're not really getting a very good resolution here. So what we can do is we can actually increase the number of times we're integrating to, and oops, oh, <laughs> and if you're going to do that, remember also to increase the size of the arrays you're saving it. And now you can really start to see, and you could do this over a short period of time, right? So let's say we just want to integrate a day, but we'll do it with a really dense resolution, and you can see the arcs of these planets moving over time. Now that's not the prettiest plot in the world, but luckily for us, the lovely people that made Rebound actually gave us a function to do this uh, a lot easier. And you don't even need to integrate for this, you just need to pass it a simulation. And it will basically determine what the orbits are and show what they look like. So let's do that. Rebound.orbit plot is the name of this, and you just pass this in, and then you want to show the plot. Voila! Magic! So you can see here the star, the inner planet, and the outer planet. Now there's a lot of options you can use in orbit plot to make this a little bit prettier, and orbit plot will start to kind of break down if you get into more complicated situations, like if you have rapidly changing orbital elements, um, and if you have bodies that are orbiting something other than the central object, then you need to do, do some slightly different things and take that into account. But for basic cases, orbit plot is just really, really great. I love orbit plot. You could use orbit plot to animate the outcomes if you wanted by calling orbit plot every time you integrate. Um, and then what you could also do is instead of looking at like the x, y positions, you could actually just look at this over time. So we could use time as the x-axis here. And now based on the way that I wrote these arrays, I'm going to need to transpose them, just change the rows and columns. And we can look at the x and y positions. It was dashed just to differentiate them. And you can see that uh, you're basically getting this kind of sinusoidal behavior because it's passing regularly. And if you know much about the unit circle, you know that it's a sign. <laughs> okay, so there you have it. You just successfully ran an end-body simulation. You made Newton very, very proud. Now this was obviously a super brief introduction, but hopefully it was enough to kind of dip your toes in and then you can actually go and look at the website for the documentation for Rebound. They absolutely have wonderful documentation. Um, there is a quick start guide and um, examples, lovely, lovely examples, um, which I use, I still use all the time, even though I've been using Rebound for like five years. Um, and before you know it, you'll be doing what you can see I am using Rebound in here. I wrote that code up in a module instead. See, I do sometimes actually follow good practices when it comes to my coding. So here's the, this is the function that was being called in that. But you can see I'm still doing some of those things we talked about, right? I set up this this array of times so that I can integrate over times. I did the for it and enumerate times, and then, except now I'm allowing for there to be collisions and what, what I want to happen when there are collisions. I'm also checking for if the orbits are crossing and things like that. Um, but it's pretty much exactly what I just showed you on a slightly more complicated level. So there you have it. I hope you learned a little bit of something, and I will see you again next time.